So good morning, everyone. Uh, welcome to today's uh, Journal Club. Uh, we're excited to uh, talk about four articles looking at uh, a couple of different topics, but really mainly focusing on the treatment of thoracolumbar burst fractures, as well as classifications of trauma uh, in the spine literature. Um, today, uh, we have two of our excellent fellows uh, from Mayo Clinic here, uh, Dr. Adnan Omar, uh, and Dr. Benjamin Struford, who are going to help us with the presentations. I'm Arjun Sebastian. I'm one of the orthopedic spine staff here, and we should be joined hopefully soon by uh, Dr. Brett Friedman, who's uh, one of my partners as well. Uh, but so that we keep things uh, running on time, I'll uh, have Adam start with uh, this first paper out of JBGS looking at operative versus non-operative treatment of thoracolumbar burst fractures. Uh, this is a study by Wood and all in JBGS. All right. So Good morning, everyone. Hope everyone's doing well. So my name is Adam Omar. I'm one of the current spine fellows here at Mayo Clinic. So the first paper, just like Dr. Sebastian mentioned, uh, is titled Operative Compared with Non-Operative Treatment of Thoracolumbar Burst Fracture with Neurological Deficit. This article was published about five years ago uh, in JBJS by Dr. Wood and all. This was a level one uh, study. So the purpose of this study was to assess what the optimal treatment is for stable thoracolumbar burst fractures in patients who are neurologically intact by evaluating long-term follow-up. Uh, they do mention that the literature has been conflicting in terms of optimal treatment as there no consensus is available. Some authors argue for operative intervention in order to achieve immediate stability uh, and to mobilize the patient, while others argue for non-operative uh, management to avoid any risk and morbidity that's associated with uh, surgery. Uh, so in order to determine what the best uh, treatment was, the authors of this current study back in 2003 uh, conducted a randomized controlled trial uh, and enrolled patients from 1992 uh, to 1998. They compared the outcomes of 47 patients uh, who received either surgical or non-operative treatment of a stable thoracolumbar burst fracture. Non-operative treatment consisted of bracing and casting, while the surgical group uh, uh, was consisted of anterior corpectomy uh, and fusion or posterior pedicle screw instrumentation uh, and fusion. So for their four-year uh, results, uh, they show no difference in clinical uh, or radiographic outcomes, but there was a higher rate of complications that they noted among the operatively uh, treated patients. So, however, after their 2003 study, a contradictory randomized controlled trial was uh, published by Sabanga and all. This was a multi-center perspective randomized trial comparing operative and non-operative uh, treatment of similar fracture types in patients who were neurologically intact. In their study, they really found opposite findings uh, where patients who were treated surgically uh, had less pain, better function, and higher rates of returns work than those treated without uh, surgery. So because of the conflicting literature and the difference in the follow-up duration among the papers, uh, the current authors of this study wanted to see if their findings in 2003 uh, would remain similar at longer follow-ups. Uh, in order to do this, they conducted a 16 to 22-year follow-up of their original patients. So this is the study flow of the project. Um, the 47 patients who initially agreed to participate in the original randomized uh, controlled trial in 2003 were contacted once again in 2012 and 2013. About 80% of the patients, as you can see, uh, of the operative and non-operative cohorts were able to be reached to follow up. Uh, they do mention, uh, looking at table one, that the patients who were able to be contacted for follow up as well as uh, further analysis did not differ significantly in terms of demographics. They do mention that the patient-related outcomes at their baseline, as well as their four-year results, uh, were similar, uh, suggesting that these patients were a good uh, group to have to compare. <clears throat> so looking at the radiographic analysis at long-term outcome for the two groups, uh, by comparing their admission kyphosis measurements uh, to their four-year follow-up, uh, they, at long-term uh, follow-up, the amount of kyphosis remained stable in the operative group, um, while in the non-operative group, there was a slight increase uh, in the kyphosis. However, no correlation was found between the amount of the final kyphosis and degree of, of pain, uh, as well as uh, disability uh, that was reported among the patients. They do mention that de degeneration of the lumbar spine uh, caudal to the instrumentation or the fracture uh, was seen more commonly in the instrumented group, and this was noted to be significant. 
uh, at an average of about 20 years, the median pain score measured on the VAS scale uh, was four for the operative group and 1.5 uh, for the uh, non-operative group. Uh, there was no significant change, however, uh, over the years, uh, as you can see here. Uh, however, uh, the same trend can also be find, uh, found in the ODI, but the overall comparison of the VAS at the 20 year mark uh, was significant. Uh, looking at the Roland Morris functional disability score, however, we can see that over the years there were, there were some uh, significant uh, difference among the groups. <laughs> Lastly, uh, they looked at the SF36 scores at an average of about 20 years for both groups. Uh, six uh, of the eight scores on the SF36 uh, favored non-operative management to a significant degree. They did also mention that there was a higher percentage of, uh, in the non-operative group that was also working 72 to 47%, uh, but they didn't make any conclusions regarding whether or not this had anything to do with the, the surgery uh, or the treatment options. Uh, they also did mention that three patients in the uh, operative group were still taking narcotic medications uh, while none in the non-operative group was taking medications. So in conclusion, uh, radiographic analysis of these patients were similar to their four-year mark, um, and those uh, treated without surgery uh, did report less pain and more function uh, than those uh, were, that were treated with surgery, uh, which led to a strong statement by the authors. Uh, they believe that non-operative management uh, is the optimal management of these injuries. Uh, I do think this is a, a great paper. It is a randomized uh, study and the authors were able to relatively have long follow-up with these patients. As far as the surgery uh, goes, uh, I believe two patients had an anterior approach, uh, but the majority of the patients um, had a posterior approach. So it would have been interesting if they would have compared those as well and see if there was any difference in terms of uh, pain or disability between those groups as well. But I'm just gonna uh, open it up uh, to the panel here for discussion. That was a great uh, review of a sort of a classic paper. Uh, I can't think of too many papers on trauma that, you know, we have long-term follow-up like this. Um, and so I'd be curious, um, I see Dr. Friedman's joined us on the line here. Uh, what are your thoughts, Brett? You know, do you think um, that given the approach that was taken and, and given the um, time at which these surgeries were done, do you think things have changed significantly now that uh, perhaps we'd see different results with operative management today using sort of different or more minimally invasive techniques? Or do you think the findings still hold true um, or, or valid for today's practices? Okay. Hey, sorry. Uh, thanks for uh, uh, having me involved. So the uh, uh, I, I think that this is a, you know, it's a, it's always a special to have uh, level one evidence, especially in trauma, uh, where this paper appropriately points out that follow-up rates greater than one year, um, more than 50% are, are pretty rare. I, I think there's some key uh, features of the study that are important to look at. And the biggest one is median age. And, and so the, you know, the middle age range was 62. So these are uh, your um, average typical burst fracture. And, and, um, and so I, I think that there is certainly things to be gained from this. There's not a lot of 62 year olds looking to get back to work. Uh, but in terms of the operative management, this is a pedicle screw rod construct. Uh, I, I, I think that the uh, technology hasn't changed substantially. I don't know that the minimally invasive approach is going to radically change the results here. Uh, I, I think that this is one of uh, several attempts uh, to try and quantify um, uh, where the uh, value statement is in this uh, um, uh, approach. Uh, so uh, we, uh, with uh, spine uh, trauma, we have this opportunity, unlike degenerative spine, uh, in which uh, uh, it's really physics entering the body and, and trying to understand uh, the impact of that. So it's, it's a more pure uh, um, problem. Uh, and uh, um, I, I think work like this and others uh, trying to define uh, where uh, that, that uh, needle is between operative versus non-operative uh, uh, benefit and management is. Um, this, this study does not uh, sway me one way or the other on its own. Uh, it's in the context of a body of work. Another big piece of this study to point out is that a lot of these people were treated with cast and an extension cast is a very different mode of immobilization external than a brace. A brace you can take off, I'm sure most people do. Uh, an extension cast actually has some corrective features to it. So um, uh, to answer your question directly as best I can, because I don't do many things directly, uh, 
the uh, is that this is uh, um, one piece of an overall puzzle uh, in trying to interpret uh, the, uh, the the right role for surgery and non operative care. But it wouldn't change with minimally invasive, in my opinion. Yeah, I mean, I think an interesting part of uh, this article is if you look at the 20, the folks that they had 20 year outcomes on, I mean, the ODI scores and pain scores for the operative group were, um, you know, uh, uh, much higher, so, or, or significantly higher. So um, it definitely makes you think a little bit uh, about how we should be managing these folks. Um, do you ever place people, uh, or do any of our panelists place people into extension casts for burst fractures? Or most people using brace. This is Jens. Yeah. So this is a, a great discussion, and thank you for bringing uh, bringing up this landmark uh, paper. So it's amazing how we still don't have a good consensus on thoracolumbar fractures without neurology <clears throat> in isolated circumstances. Um, and this paper highlights that we've had Kirk Wood here several times at our annual trauma course, and so we've had a chance to go behind the scenes and do a deeper dive. You can see it in our recorded lecture library. Uh, great guy, great speaker, unbelievable effort to do this. Now, to your point, um, uh, I had a uh, one of the last casting tables for Rizzer casts at Harborview, so we actually did perform hyperextension casts. And I do have to say, uh, empirically speaking, if you allow me to say that, um, it has a much better corrective feature, exactly analogous to what Brett said. Um, than what a brace has. A brace is more or less just a activity restrictor, a reminder. A cast can correct uh, the right patient, the right body habitus. It may have to be exchanged. It's a lot of work. It takes a lot of conviction to it. To the paper itself, it really has one major, actually two major flaws. Number one, when we looked at the deeper cases that uh, Kirk was willing to present here, there are a lot of cases in there that honestly would have not been operated on by, I think, most of us. And that's the crux of a study where you kind of have in an exclusion criteria and you farm patients into that and you then have to do what the protocol dictates to do. The second thing is the patients who did not get enrolled in there is just as revealing because Nowadays, for American patients, that goes to about 15, 20 years ago, just as much. It takes a very special mindset of a patient to go into a prospective, randomized trial, especially a non-surgical to surgical one. And that is a big deal. That's a very special mindset of a patient and not necessarily the regular citizens that you'd expect. So that's one of the flaws. So patients were operated probably really did not need it. And uh, the, the selection bias was probably pretty substantial. But in the end, as identified, surgery changes patients' lives and it can do it uh, for the worse if not uh, used prudently. I personally don't think that MIS surgery, and we'll talk about that later, I think, has uh, changed that equation. Thank you. Well, those are all great comments, and I think that's a nice segue into um, our second article here, uh, looking at five to seven-year follow-up on posterior short segment fixation uh, with or without fusion for thoracolumbar burst fractures, um, also from JBGS, a little bit older. Um, Adam, you want to take us away? Yeah, sure. So this was the article that was published in JBGS in 2009 by Dr. Dianal. This was titled Posterior Short Segment Fixation with or Without Fusion for Thoracolumbar Burst Fractures. Uh, like Dr. Uh, Arjun mentioned, uh, this was a five to seven year prospective randomized trial. Uh, so the objective of this study was to evaluate the efficacy of short segment fixation without fusion uh, and compare it with short segment fixation uh, with fusion uh, as there's insufficient evidence with respect to long-term clinical effectiveness uh, in the literature. Uh, the article mentions that the optimal treatment of burst fractures is still being defined or debated in 2009, and some authors argue for fixation in order to expedite patient mobility, uh, and that fusion also may not be necessary uh, as certain patients with stable thoracolumbar burst fractures um, do not experience a significant loss of correction with time, uh, and they do uh, refer to a study that they published a year earlier with that statement. Um, for their methods, and in order to evaluate this, they performed a randomized controlled trial where they enrolled patients from a single level one trauma center. Uh, they excluded patients with major fractures at other sites 
visceral injuries, um, fractures secondary to osteoporosis or a pathological process. Uh, therefore, 73 patients were enrolled in their study. Uh, the fracture patterns were similar in all patients and they were classified based on uh, the dentist as well as the load share and classification on McCormick. Um, all fractures were thoracolumbar burst fractures involving the superior end plate or a dentist type B fracture as I highlighted there. Uh, they also ensured that all fractures had a load, short, uh, load sharing score of uh, six or less, uh, indicating that these fractures were mildly uh, comminuted and less likely uh, to fail after a posterior um, short segment fixation. Uh, associated neurological deficit was not uh, a criteria for exclusion, uh, and about one third of the patients had a neurological deficit. They didn't mention that one patient had a complete uh, deficit, uh, while the rest had an incomplete deficit. Um, all patients were then randomized via a computer generated system. Uh, 37 patients were in the fusion group, and 36 patients were in the uh, non fusion group. Um, here are the baseline characteristics uh, that they put in table one. Uh, both groups uh, were similar with respect to most demographic variables. Uh, from here, we can see that majority of patients did not have a PLC injury uh, and that about 40% of patients uh, had follow up to the seven year mark of the study. Uh, the surgical procedures were performed by a single surgeon for all patients in order to eliminate uh, the surgeon variable. Uh, all implants as well as the post-operative care were similar among both groups and functional outcomes were then assessed by an independent uh, observer. Uh, table two here demonstrates that there's no uh, difference uh, in the two groups with regards to the interval between injury uh, and to the op time of operation, uh, as well as the duration of hospitalization. However, they do uh, show significant difference uh, in the operative time as well as the amount of blood loss uh, that was seen in the fusion group compared to the non-fusion group. Uh, they also looked at the average local kyphosis. Uh, kyphosis at the time of admission. Uh, as we can see, there was a significant decrease after the surgery uh, and there were slight increases over time. Uh, however, uh, the difference was not significant between the two groups at any time interval throughout, uh, throughout the study. Uh, as I mentioned earlier, one third of the patients uh, did have a neurological deficit uh, at the time of admission. Uh, and at the time of the latest follow-up, uh, the neurological recovery, recovery of a one Frankel uh, greater or more was seen in 22 um, out of the 25 patients as you can see here. Uh, the bar graph uh, on the bottom right here is illustrating uh, that the rate of Asia score was also pretty much the same. Uh, so <clears throat> there was no significant, significant difference between the groups in terms of neurological recovery. Um, lastly, uh, they looked at SF36 scores as well for quality of life and found no difference uh, among the treatment groups. As far as VAS goes, they mentioned that back pain was similar in both groups. However, they do mention that the majority of patients, uh, 25 out of the 37, I believe, uh, still had discomfort at their uh, donor sites. Uh, so in conclusion, they do mention that posterior short segment fixation was acceptable uh, for the fracture type in the study uh, and led to a decrease uh, perioperative blood loss uh, as well as operative time. Uh, as well as the elimination of donor sites secondary to iliac uh, crest uh, grafting. Uh, <clears throat> overall, I thought this was a, a good study too in terms of you know uh, making it randomized and having um, follow up. Uh, as far as the preoperative neurological status, they didn't really go into much detail in terms of what the incomplete injury was, whether or not this was a simple root injury or something that can spontaneously just uh, heal on its own with non-operative management. As far as um, the donor site uh, morbidity, uh, that may take some, um, I guess, um, point away from the study because what if we they just used uh, local autograft alone or allograft and eliminated the pain at the donor site, would that have been a better study for fusion versus not fusion for these injuries? So I'm just going to open it up for discussion here. So again, a nice summary, uh, Ad, and I think, um, you know, this is another good paper. I, I'd sort of put a plug in there for the load sharing classification. I think that is a really important and salient point in this paper that they uh, specifically excluded fractures with a load sharing classification of six or greater. And um, I think we've all probably seen cases where short segment fixations used in the setting of highly comminuted fractures and, and they fail into kyphosis. Um, 
Dr. Friedman, uh, any thoughts regarding um, fusion versus non-fusion in this setting? Yeah, so, yeah, again, I think that this is a very nice study. So we're seeing two level one studies, uh, you know, this one here, 100% follow-up at five years, uh, reasonable allocation, a priori power analysis. So it truly is a level one study if, it, uh, if it's done to the way it was uh, described in the methods. Uh, w one of the problems with this study is that uh, the conclusion is pretty strong and it lacks a, a, a big um, extra comment, and that is in patients who have iliac crest bone grafting. And so one of the problems is that uh, all the folks here had iliac crest bone grafting, and, and I think that's a fantastic biologically active way to achieve fusion. Uh, but if that's an explanation for some of the uh, pain difference between those who are fused and not fused, uh, then we wind up with uh, um, uh, a, a blurred picture and, and, a, and a reduced generalizability of the results that there is no difference between um, a fused spine and a unfused spine at long term. Uh, I uh, um, am someone that uh, um, hasn't yet bought into the concept of uh, spinal fixation alone. Uh, it's rare in orthopedics that you take a synovial joint and you immobilize it for six months to 24 months and then expect it to behave again. It's also rare that you take a synovial joint that has diastasis or uh, uh, some type of step off and expect it to function again. And, and this is what you have to accept in the situation of a burst fracture treated with fixation alone. Um, I, I think that uh, uh, one of the challenges with our, this article is also going to be sort of lumping phenomena. Uh, you know, a lot of these patients, uh, to Yen's point, uh, would probably have been non-operative if you really apply a TLIX criteria to this, uh, uh, or, uh, in the sense that the, um, uh, uh, I think, uh, you know, a third of them had a neurologic injury, so two-thirds would have zero for their neurology score. Uh, and there wasn't much mention, there was a, a mention of ligamentous and osteoligamentous, which accounted for a small subset too. So upwards of, uh, you know, somewhere between two thirds and 80% of these patients uh, could have been treated non-operatively, would have been in um, um, a gray zone. And, and so uh, may have been something where um, uh, the operative uh, uh, choice uh, may have also had some impact on uh, the outcomes. Uh, certainly from the neurology standpoint, uh, everyone was uh, either normal or just short of normal as a Frankel D, so, uh, or for the most part. So uh, I think that uh, uh, good effort, good study, you can't control all the variables, uh, you try your best, uh, but when you make really strong conclusions, um, I, I think you need to be limited to the, uh, what the results show you. Uh, in terms of the lack of difference in clinical outcomes, I think some of that could have been related to the uh, posterior, um, uh, to the bone grafting. Uh, and, uh, um, and I think that's a, a big piece of the puzzle. So, uh, Dr. Chapman, I, I see some uh, discussion about classification, and, and again, we did discuss about the load sharing classification in this paper. Uh, I guess question one would be, do you uh, ever perform fixation without fusion for um, trauma? Battery is out. Sorry, my battery just went out. I uh, apologize for the delay. So uh, load sharing is a big deal. This is one of the variables uh, that is um, obviously very important. The McCormick paper remains very relevant in that regard. Uh, bone mass index, uh, sorry, body mass index and bone quality are other factors. The devil's in the detail, as you said, and these studies are way under power to take all these into account. Uh, when we talk about fusion after a surgery, that's obviously a desired outcome. What really matters for burst fractures is if the burst segment itself fuses to the upper segment, meaning that disc injury with that disc that got imploded into the vertebra, uh, rostral to the actual burst fracture, if that calcifies, that's a fusion. So if you actually do a posterolateral fusion, is probably less relevant than if this fusion occurs. Uh, the early attempts at short segment fixation were flawed because they used a deformity instrumentation that was mechanically unsuitable to hold this. And the devil in the detail, again, of proper instrument placements so that you had bicortical screws with sufficiently large screws was not fulfilled. There was also an overemphasis on something particularly bad, which was uh, ligamental taxis, a complete misconcept in the reduction of burst fractures because the PLL is actually torn. Uh, in any burst factor, more than 20% canal compromise. So those are some of the many little variables that come into play here. Uh, so again, 
Um, limiting of fusion is a big deal. The lower you get in a burst fracture, uh, in the thoracal lumbar junction, you can probably go down to L2 without sacrificing too much uh, in the long term. Uh, uh, caudal motion segment survival expectation. But uh, in principle, again, being sparing on caudal fixation levels is a big deal and has, I think, stood the test of time. Thanks. And so I just so want to add one thing real quick um, uh, as a shout out to Jens on this. It, it, the concept ligamental taxis, that little wispy thing, whether it is or is not intact, uh, can somehow um, place and push back that trapezoidal wedged keyed fragment, that constant fragment you see in the burst fracture in the posterior superior aspect of the vertebral body. It gets stuck between the pedicles. That really takes uh, impaction with a mallet to actually get it to go forward is definitely a, a flawed concept. And you see a lot of folks that go through distraction, ligamentotaxis as their only means for uh, decompression without a direct posterior decompression. And you wind up with a stenosis that's unchanged. So I, I definitely think that's uh, um, something for us as a group to have a, a high scrutiny level for if we're um, trying to get a canal that's compromised to be uncompromised simply by uh, pulling the parts apart. And so I guess uh, let's say if to both Jens and Brett, if, if the fracture was one that had a higher degree of comminution, load sharing uh, classification of greater than six, um, does that necessitate anterior column support or uh, would you simply uh, seek out uh, performing a longer construct if, if necessary? My personal preference nowadays uh, is to do a short segment fixation with very carefully placed screws, reduction of the deformity, uh, avoidance of over distraction, uh, very similar to what Brett said, uh, decompression and ventral disimpaction of the fragment so that there's a, a nice patent spinal canal, and then re CT the patient, evaluate the patient. Um, uh, see how they're doing and have a low threshold if the anterior column is not adequately reconstructed to have my gifted partner, Dr. Osquian, who's a magician with x uh, do a uh, minimally invasive anterior column support. So minimizing levels of fixation and uh, really getting a good deformity correction is a big deal, I think. I'm a bit more utilitarian uh, to this in, in the sense that uh, I do like that load sharing classification. I'm very algorithmic about how I treat TL fractures. Uh, and if you are seven plus, uh, I would rather keep you at uh, one level above and one level below. So I'd rather keep you at short segment. And, and so ap applying the LCS says that that would be an anterior or an anterior slash posterior. They tend to go hand in hand. Uh, by the time you've comminuted the vertebral body so much so that the canal is compromised, that the canal becomes compromised to the point that the good decompression you get anteriorly, uh, which is, uh, can be quite good from the posterior, but I don't think it's ever as good as a, a, a direct uh, corpactomy. Um, uh, is uh, another additive benefit. So if you're a LC, uh, LCS seven or more uh, uh, to keep me at one level up and one level down, uh, I will frequently do a, a, a um, open and not X lift driven uh, corpactomy. Great, well, all uh, uh, excellent uh, points and, and a nice discussion. Again, to keep us on time, I think um, we'll move on to uh, kind of the next set of papers, uh, Dr. Struford's going to be presenting these for us. The first one here, looking at the reliability of the AO classification and TLIX classification uh, for uh, injuries in the thoracolumbar lumbar spine. Uh, ben. Hey, everybody. Uh, ben Struford here, uh, one of the Mayo Spine Fellows under the tutelage of Dr. Sebastian Friedman. Um, got a couple of articles here uh, as Dr. Sebastian uh, nicely introduced the reliability assessment of the AO spine, thoracolumbar spine injury classification versus TLICs uh, for uh, thoracolumbar spine injuries. This is a result of a multi-center study uh, published in the European Spine Journal in 2017. So as a bit of background, uh, we're all familiar with classification schemes that uh, do provide us a common language. Uh, the, the goal, maybe a, an additional goal is is to try to effectively and reliably guide treatment and provide prognostic indicate prognostic information, not only for us as uh, surgeons in treatment, uh, but also kind of to to expect uh, uh, things from our patients and expect uh, recovery versus uh, other complications that might come arise. So this uh, this article seeks to. Uh, 
compare the uh, TLIX classification scheme versus the AO spine thoracolumbar spine entry classification system, of which there isn't uh, quite as nice of a TLIX uh, or an acronym or something to describe in that one, but the AO spine classification system. We're all uh, quite familiar, no doubt, with the uh, TLIX uh, score as it's, as it's additive between the injury morphology uh, with several different types, the PL st PLC status, uh, intact, indeterminate versus injured, and the neurologic status of the patient, whether intact or single nerve root involvement versus incomplete, complete uh, spinal cord injuries versus cauda syndrome. What we may be a little less familiar with, uh, certainly as a, as a learner for me, uh, less familiar with the AO spine uh, injury classification scheme, um, divided essentially into uh, different types of compression, distraction, and translation injuries. Uh, so only three uh, kind of injury morphology and fracture types versus the TLIX four, uh, four types. So uh, the compressive injuries are, compression injuries, excuse me, are divided into non-structural or non-structural injuries, um, such as a transverse or spinous process fracture, wedge compression injuries, split injuries of the vertebral body, and uh, incomplete and complete burst fractures. As you move up in the uh, classification scheme uh, towards the upper right corner, you get into distraction injuries, which are uh, divided into tension band disruptions versus uh, whether it's a, a transosseous uh, or just a, a ligamentous or ligamento osseous and uh, hyperextension injuries. Uh, and, and finally C with translation or uh, dislocation injuries. So for, uh, for an algorithm for classification, uh, this, this I thought was a, a nice little diagram. Uh, this is actually from the AO Spine website, not, a, not included in this article, but just for, for kind of a, a reminder on how these get classified. Um, at first, the, uh, the AO Spine looks at displacement and dislocation. Obviously, if that's yes, uh, you start with a, a C as the number, um, or C as the letter, excuse me. Uh, tension band injuries uh, start with B, uh, and they're divided into anterior versus posterior, and posterior is further subdivided. If you have a vertebral body fracture, they go into the A, uh, A nomenclature, and obviously the vertebral processes are the A zeros. Neurologic injury is also involved in the AO spine uh, classification scheme uh, with uh, different grades versus neurologic, neurologically intact versus complete, uh, all the way down to complete spinal cord injury. There's additionally another nomenclature um, uh, that was not uh, assessed in this article with an M classification uh, talking about uh, surgical decision making. Uh, just as a case example, uh, this is a, a, a just a kind of walk through uh, what the AO spine classification might look like for a certain fracture. Uh, this this one right here uh, is is more of a tension band type injury, and it's a injury to the posterior tension band with a monosegmental osseous disruption, so a B1 uh, type distraction injury, just as an example. Uh, and this is what you might suggest would be for a TLIX. So getting back to the article, um, trying to compare these two, the, the methods involved in the article, they, they looked at 50 consecutive patients at the Indian Spinal Injuries Center um, and uh, identified clinical records and imaging, sent these, to, sent these by PowerPoint slides to 11 surgeons at six different centers in four different countries and ask them essentially to classify them uh, by the TLIX and AO spine injury classification for each. They waited six weeks and repeated the same, uh, shuffled the cases, I should say, and then repeated the same classification. This is uh, with an attempt to compare inter-rater and in intra-rater reliability. Um, the uh, kappa value, the kappa statistic is uh, just as a reminder is on the lower right with near perfect agreement is above 0.8. Uh, and as you start to fall towards the 0 0.5, you get into you know moderate and then even, even further down is only fair agreement. So for the results, um, they, this is for inter-rater statistics. And then on the left here is comparing TLIX to the right comparing the AO spine classification uh, scheme. And you can see on the left for TLIX fracture morphology for inter-rater, that's between two different raters, had a kappa or agreement statistic of only 0 0.43. Um, and if you, if, you compare, if you compare that directly to the AO spine uh, classification system, fracture type, this is again, just an A, B, or C, 
received a CAPA agreement, inter-rater agreement value of 0.59. So technically within that moderate agreement, um, but actually in the, uh, in the lower half of the slide, uh, I sort of highlighted for TLIX on the left, uh, the best agreement was actually co for compression fractures, just achieving a higher uh, kappa statistic in burst fractures, which also had a, a 0 0.6. Uh, but the uh, performance of TLIX for identifying translation injuries at 0 0.36 and distraction injuries at 0 0.28 was actually uh, towards the fair or almost to the poor uh, inter-rater reliability. Um, I should also highlight for TLIX, the total score, which they've asked the, the raters to provide, uh, inter-rater reliability was only 0 0.29, which is in the, uh, uh, towards the fair uh, category. Again, the AO spine had the best agreement for the same kinds of things at the fracture morphology with, uh, uh, with those type A and C injuries, and then the worst for type B injuries. So I think we're identifying a common theme that the uh, type B or uh, uh, the type B injuries can be uh, more difficult to classify. Intra rater uh, reliability shows higher reliabilities overall, uh, but actually, even between it, within the same rater for the, the same case, uh, time after time, it's still uh, only 0 0.59 or, or 0 0.68 for fracture morphology. There was good agreement for neurologic status throughout. So, just to kind of summarize the results for TLEX, there was moderate inter rater and intra rater reliability for fracture type and the integrity of the PLC. Only fair to moderate inter rater and intra rater reliability of the total score. The AO spine uh, classification scheme found moderate to substantial inter, uh, inter and intra rater reliability of the fracture type, again, without subtypes, um, and overall found near agreement, near perfect agreement on neurologic status. The strength and limitations of this article, I thought this was a, a, a nice article because the raters were from different regions, which might be applying this, uh, these classification schemes uh, in perhaps different ways uh, when making surgical decision making. Um, they also uh, pointed out in their discussion that uh, none of the raters in this paper were uh, involved in the development of these classification schemes, which they pointed to uh, uh, troubles with other articles in the literature, which uh, maybe more uh, predominantly written by those developers of the classification schemes. Um, and they did directly compare these two. Limitations, uh, there were 50 consecutive patients, but it, it's hard to know whether that represents the true spectrum of disease. Perhaps there was a predominance of uh, one fracture type versus another. Uh, they were clinical cases, not, not surgeons, actual patients making surgical decisions uh, on a, a live patient in front of them. And they were PowerPoint files and uh, I think lastly, a li another limitation is just it does not define, uh, they did not define any AO spine subtypes. So the, the B1s versus the B2s, et cetera. So just to kind of leave it open for discussion. Yeah, I think this is uh, an interesting paper. I guess what I was kind of scratching my head about um, reading this one, I'd be curious to hear what the other panelists thought, was that the TLIX, um had higher rating or inter-rater rely reliability for the compression burst injuries and less for the translational distraction injuries. I thought those would have been maybe easier to pick up. So I, I didn't fully understand that. I think um, also um, the point you brought out about not describing the, the subtypes is important because that maybe makes it a little bit, um, a little bit easier when, when you're talking about the AO classification. Uh, Brett, do you have any thoughts uh, about this paper in particular? Yeah, I, you know, I think that this is uh, um, a study that has some interesting uh, uh, conflictions within the data set. So if you were to look at uh, your ability to assess morphology, they're not radically different between the two systems. And so why the scoring would be or the agreement would be so different, it's hard for me to understand. The morphology of compression and burst is the same as A. The morphology of distraction is the same as B. And the morphology of translation is the same as C. So uh, I don't know why you'd have a radical difference when you're looking at the same pictures and making essentially the same assumption. So uh, for me, um, AO, uh, I, I think it's a very simplistic platform. The concept that A means the, the segment's shorter, B means the segment's taller, and C means the segment's not the same alignment as it used to be. I think that's a very easy memory point. The problem 
problem with AO uh, classification is that it goes down this, the uh, uh, path that it has with other things in orthopedics, and that is that the subtypes become uh, quite uh, cumbersome to recall, and, and you really need to have a, a note card with you to do it right. Uh, Telix is a little bit more straightforward in that regard, and the biggest difference between these two studies, uh, at least as they were originally designed, developed, and validated, is that Telix was a scoring system that predicted prognosis, but specifically predicted treatment. Uh, AO didn't uh, reduce to a score, didn't reduce to a, a definitive, uh, this is operative, this is non-operative. And so to me, uh, in the new era of, of uh, classification systems and um, uh, musculoskeletal system in general, in which we're looking not for simple name calling or morphology based or uh, mechanism based, but actually something that pr uh, produces a prognosis and a treatment recommendation, Helix is the, uh, the favorite in that regards. One of my favorite lines uh, from this paper was uh, in their discussion, they said there exists a delicate balance between simplicity and inclusiveness of a classification system. And I think uh, that kind of alludes uh, to your point, Brett. Um, Dr. Chapman in Seattle, what uh, what classification <clears throat> system do you guys use? Or So so I'm heavily conflicted in both. Uh, I'm obviously AO and uh, Brett, I take your uh, comments uh, as constructive criticism. We tried to simplify it with a new edition, but we obviously didn't succeed. I'm sorry about that. We'll try to work on it. But uh, you raised some very important points. So me, I'm not a reviewer or uh, editor for ESJ. I would have rejected this paper on foundation because it has a, a misnomer in it in the title. It's uh, in terms of Boolean operator logic, a question of not versus, but and. Telix was created by Alex Vaccaro, who's a co-author on the paper, who's also a co-author of our AO thing, and it was an evolutionary development. Telix, as Brett has insinuated, is a severity scale. It's actually not so much a classification. So it's a rating system that meant to give us a foundational checklist of what's relevant in which the various severity subgradients were actually never statistically validated. The AO system was a, uh, trying to create a lingua franca amongst us around the world. Sorry, they just locked the sun out from us. We can't stand sunlight here in Seattle. So the change in my light complexion. But uh, the, the point is that the AO system is meant to be a, a common global language, um, even down to the numerators with some basic uh, severity implications. So it's meant to be an evolution and a true classification as opposed to the severity scale, for which we want to try to have a, a understanding of the gravitas of an injury and, as Brett said, uh, reevaluate whether surgery or non-surgical treatment and the amount of invasiveness of the surgery stands in a relationship with the injury severity. So it's, it's and, uh, the title of the paper should have been and and not versus. Uh, that's what I end up in. I'm obviously heavily conflicted because I, I like both and I, I try to have our fellows and our radiologists use the AO language because I think it is the simplest. And even if we can just agree on ABCs, uh, getting down to those numbers is actually pretty simple, um, I think, and reasonably reproducible, not everywhere in the world, but most places. And an interesting phenomenon, just to find the end of my comment, which is getting lengthy, I apologize, is the subdivision of A3 versus A4. When we did global uh, reliability studies with AO, we found that there's actually a reasonable kappa uh, agreement uh, coefficient between A3 and A4, except for Germany and the German-speaking countries, where they routinely overrated A3s as A4s. We think it's because it justifies their far more aggressive surgical intervention uh, a culture, but we're not totally sure about that. So this is one of those fascinating things about why people see things they do and what they actually then uh, find essential. I'll end here. Thank you. Yeah, I think uh, both great points. I think for me personally, I think the TLIC score is kind of, do I need to get up out of bed and come in? Uh, and, and so to your point, Dr. Chapman, kind of giving us a sense of severity. Um, having trained with Alex, you know, I, I do like the AO score, at least for description purposes. I think it's a nice way for me to understand, you know, even before I look at it, kind of what the fracture morphology is. And so I do, I do kind of push our residents and fellows to learn that as well. Um, so that brings us to um, our last uh, paper. Um, and so Dr. Struford's going to talk a little bit about uh, this paper here, looking at patients with the TLIC score of four treated with surgery versus initial conservative treatment. Um, go ahead, Ben. 
All right. So this this one is uh, published uh, as Dr. Sebastian already sort of gave the title, but then uh, this uh, one was published in Clinical Spine Surgery uh, in 2018. So the background for this one is that the treatment for a TLIC score of four is controversial, and uh, they the paper authors note that prior randomized controlled trials have have had relatively low power, and uh, there's a typo there, I apologize, and may not have fully taken into account uh, PLC injuries, nor controlled for them in an effective way, um, or an objective way, I, I suppose I could say. So the methods for this paper, it's a level three retrospective uh, single center study from patients get garnered from 26, 2006, excuse me, to 2013, with an inclusion criteria of a TLIX uh, score of four, burst fracture with an indeterminate PLC, uh, six month uh, minimum follow-up. The uh, Additionally, the comparison for the uh, comparison groups in this study were operative versus non-operative. Uh, the outcomes looked at the VAS back score, the ODI, the SF uh, uh, pain component score, work status and time to return to work. Uh, they had a, a relatively detailed analysis using univariate and logistic regression, which I'll get into a little bit uh, more. Uh, one thing that they, they did identify as a potential confounder is a sort of a surgery propensity score. So these it was not a, a randomized uh, trial in any way that they had predefined uh, determinants for who is an operative versus who is a non-operative candidate. So they attempted to, uh, to try to identify what would be a, uh, a, some, something that is a, a and increase the likelihood of having surgery based on the age, injury, severity score, and a composite PLC score. And that composite PLC score is used in this study to help determine the integrity of the PLC complex uh, from radiographic parameters a, uh, a alone, uh, rather than a, a sort of a clinical acumen. So they looked at uh, uh, historical uh, X-ray CTs for kyphotic angles less than 14 degrees or greater than 14 degrees, greater than 14 degrees, getting a score of one. The number of facets that was injured, zero, one, or two, and interspinous process widening, uh, getting, getting the, that last uh, one point. So a score from zero to four. And this will be sort of important as we, we take a look at their baseline clinical and radiographic uh, characteristics. So I'll highlight the uh, sort of important salient points here uh, for their age. The surgical group tended to be younger, and that was clinic that was statistically significant, as well as the number uh, who were treated in a brace, uh, obviously predominance in the non-surgical group. And the mean PLC score was also significantly different between the surgical group and the non-surgical group. Perhaps not surprising, uh, there was a in, in an indeterminate. Uh, TLIC score, uh, those who had more of a suggestion of PLC injury uh, perhaps uh, were treated more with uh, surgery as, as identified in this, this retrospective review. So looking at a univariate analysis of these clinical outcomes, sort of comparing the uh, primary outcomes of the ODI SF12 uh, PCS, the VA's back score and the work status, the mean time, time to work, Initially, those who are, were employed and not work, or excuse me, employed and working, uh, they found a clinically, or a, excuse me, a statistically significant difference in those in the surgical group uh, that were working versus the non-surgical group. However, this, uh, this table is actually quite confusing, so I tried to break it down a little bit. Essentially, what they, what they did as, a, as that second line, they're employed and not working, they excluded retirees and students and homemakers from the employed category. So essentially it, was, it meant that um, there was no difference in those that wanted to work, as in you know, someone who's a, of, a, of working age and those that could work. So essentially they, they tried to control for the fact that maybe it's a retiree who did not, did not want to reach gainful employment uh, rather than saying that that person was say too disabled to work uh, they excluded them from a secondary analysis and actually found no significant difference between those that wanted to and could work. thought that was a little bit of a confusing uh, way to describe it, so I, I want to take a time to sort of explain that. Looking at the uh, uh, logistic regression analysis and, and with controlling uh, for, co or for confounding variables, 
uh, they found that uh, controlling for brace use and that surgical propensity score, as I, as I mentioned before, there was no significant difference in these main outcome measures uh, between operative and non-operative groups. So they found no difference between operative and non-operative groups. The strengths of this study uh, were that it had 70% uh, follow-up in, in a trauma population. I, I think they could be applauded for that. I, certainly you could list that in the limitations category as well. However, 70% I thought was, a, was an adequate, uh, adequate number. They did perform a rig rigorous statistical analysis, again, treating those, co those confounding variables appropriately, I thought, in, uh, in their logistic regression. Um, they were also uh, additionally powered to detect differences in ODI, however, not the work status. So in the limitation side over there, you can see the power was only 0 0.49 to detect the difference in work status. And I, I actually applaud them as well for kind of uh, uh, appropriately kind of disclosing that in their, in their limitation sections. Again, only six months follow-up, perhaps a longer follow-up could, uh, could discern true differences here. And uh, again, uh, the final limitation, as I mentioned early on, was that this was really a case-by-case -case or surgeon determination uh, for surgery or surgeon and patient determination. So just in conclusion, for burst fractures with T, uh, the TLIC score of four and an indeterminate PLC, operative and non-operative treatment really do, does appear to provide similar outcomes in work status, pain, and disability measures. And uh, certainly if, if larger studies were, were performed to detect differences, uh, should they exist uh, in these domains, they may be needed. Thank you. Yeah, great summary, Ben. Um, I think this paper basically to me highlights um, how much we still have this, the problem with the TLIC score, which is this gray zone uh, with regards to the PLC. And um, I do think to some extent uh, the PLC part of it, um, maybe, you know, the surgeon's aggressiveness plays a role here. Uh, but uh, Brett, do you have any systematic way of assessing the integrity of the PLC to make that decision? Um, do you get an MRI routinely on these uh, on, on your trauma patients to look at the PLC? Um, yeah, that's a great question. And, and uh, without um, issue, the uh, most uh, challenging part of applying the TLIX is identifying the integrity of the PLC. Uh, and in my opinion, uh, uh, that is best done with an MRI. Uh, and so as long as uh, it is safe uh, and appropriate uh, for the patient, uh, we obtain MRIs um, uh, routinely, uh, especially on tweener cases. I mean, if you have someone with an incomplete injury, you already have a score that gets you in the operating room from that alone. Uh, and so if you're um, talking about making a decision between a burst fracture with no neurology and a intact PLC versus a burst fracture with no neurology and a uh, clearly disrupted PLC, uh, that, that to me is a radically different injury and therefore uh, uh, merits the uh, additional information that's obtained from an MRI. Uh, the MRI shows you the white line of surgery, which is disruption of uh, the uh, ligament and phlebum through the interspinous and then most importantly involving the supraspinous ligament dorsally. When I see that, uh, that to me is uh, um, uh, the, the clearest uh, demonstration of a posterior ligamentous complex injury. Uh, I, I think that the uh, CT metrics that were um, enumerated here, kyphotic angle, number of facets involved, interspinous whiting, is helpful, a bit uh, more effective, I think, from a methodology standpoint, if they use that somehow to um, apply a standard between, uh, yes, the PLC is uh, intact or not. The averages of the PLC score were quite low on either category. I think what we're going to see from our three papers here that talked about clinical outcomes are that uh, all of them were really in the gray zone. Uh, and with a strict application of current classification systems uh, and uh, uh, maybe uh, uh, folks that do more trauma than less, uh, you would have seen maybe a lot of these not be in the operative consideration. And so I think that also skews some of the understanding. Uh, but to answer your question, I love MRI. I think it's a wonderful uh, tool for uh, making discrimination for the hardest group, which are those gray folks in which you see uh, bony uh, injury, uh, you see no neurology, uh, and you see uh, you're, you're uncertain as to whether or not that ligament's intact because a lot of the CT measures require that the segment does not spontaneously re, um, uh, return to its normal posture, which actually happens quite frequently. And since ligaments have no intrinsic healing capacity, I do think that's a uh, large change to the outcome. So it's a worthwhile study.
all great points. Any other uh, thoughts from our panelists on uh, this gray zone TLIC score? So this is a great paper. So uh, some of the variables in the decision making are not uh, really caught uh, or captured in the uh, TLIC score or anything else. And that is, uh, is the patient going to be compliant or not? Uh, here in Seattle, at least, we have a fair number of people, unlike you guys in Minnesota, we have a large number of people who are not going to be compliant. It's just not even a question. Uh, similarly, we seem to be very body mass index uh, uh, burdened in these gray zone patients. We seem to have a lot of people who are really big and who will also not be compliant, and they're just not braceable. So those are two clinical variables right off the bat that are important. The old MRI question is one that's kind of been answered. I think pretty much everybody nowadays gets an MRI scan. Whether the patient's really needed or not is almost anachronistic. Um, the big problem uh, that I wanted to point out to Brett is it's still too sensitive. So um, the specificity uh, has been looked at. Uh, um, tumor's papers are great on tumor owners. Uh, to look at that, we've tried to quantify that with the AO. It's a very sensitive test. It's very tech specific in terms of did they get the right fat suppression, did they get the right T2 star image or something like that. Uh, so it's helpful, it's insightful, it's just another data point. For me, unsurpasses what my mentor, Paul Anderson, always said is, which is examine the patient. Identify if there's an inner spinous process, uh, tenderness, if there's a gap. Uh, see how a patient who's neurologically intact does in an upright position with a brace on, if they gap, if they kyphose. Those are kind of those little clinical tidbits that are very helpful in terms of trying to make up a mind if we're really not sure as to which way to go. So thank you. Yeah, I think that's a great point. The standing radiographs can be very helpful um, if you're kind of on the, on the, you know, border or on the wall or fence about what to do with these. I think if you see someone, you know, fall into kyphosis on that first standing radiograph, that kind of tells you that it's, it's something that you may want to fix. Well, if uh, that brings us kind of to the conclusion, if there are any other comments, uh, you know, feel free to reach out. But, uh, oh, sorry, Dr. Yeah, Chapman. I, I have one challenge. So thank you so much, guys, uh, from Mayo to, to bring up uh, fractures. I think it's an overlooked field, and um, it's so important because we're the experts. And this is my challenge to all of us. We should be the leaders in terms of identifying the lingua franca, the common language uh, for spine fracture terminology, getting our ERs, getting our radiologists, uh, getting internally within our departments a common uh, consensus on what language are we going to use and hopefully bury the very meritorious Denise classification once and for all because it's really not a relevant way to uh, communicate this. So thanks for the topic and hope we'll all take this kind of inspiration uh, into our new academic year. I, I couldn't agree more. I think uh, all of our panelists today, I thank both of our fellows for uh, doing all the hard work to put these presentations together and uh, the Seattle uh, Science Foundation again for hosting today. Thanks everyone. And Rick, thank you. Uh, well, thank you. Are you good Labor Day, everybody. Doctor, thank you all. Away, Great job and we appreciate it. Everybody have a safe and healthy weekend. Yeah, happy Labor Day. Bye-bye. Thanks for watching. Hit the subscribe button for more medical content.